Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3 and the Word of God this morning, and I'm glad that we have the infallible Word of God. I'm thankful this morning to know that He is real, and I'm glad that no matter where you've been, what you've done, where you've come from, or what you're in right now, there's not a need that Jesus Christ cannot supply for. The Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 7, casting all our care upon Him. You know why? Because He cares for you. It does not matter what you're going through in this very hour. There is someone up in heaven, the great God, our Savior, Jesus Christ, who spoke everything we know into existence. And what a wonderful thought to know this morning that He cares for me. Amen. Thankful to be in the Lord's house this morning. Ephesians chapter 3, and I hope to be a help to you this morning by the power of the Lord Jesus Christ and through the power of the Holy Spirit. And then we are still starting a brand new year. It's January. And as I begin to look over the congregation and I begin to look uh, at the world around us, by the way, we're in a mess. Amen. And the day that we live in, we've moved so far away from God collectively as in this country that if we have ever needed men in this country that would man up and would lead their homes, if we've ever needed women that would lead their that would lead their children, if we've ever needed pastors that would lead churches, if we've ever needed strong churches, today is the day that we need those things. I'm glad to report to you on the authority of the Word of God that there is the power of the Holy Spirit. And if there's anything that we need in this life, if there's anything that we need in 2024, it is simply a fresh touch on every one of our lives of the Holy Spirit. Ephesians chapter 3, begin reading in verse 14 this morning. The Apostle Paul to the church of Ephesus says, For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory, watch this, to be strengthened with the might of his Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth, the length, and depth, and height, watch, and to know the love of Christ. I'm glad I know it, aren't you? What a blessing to know, Will Copeland. The love of Christ, and to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge, that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. If I have any desire in this life, that is my desire that I am filled with the fullness of God, and unto him that is able, and unto him that is able, and unto him that is able, there's nothing, can I stop and say, there's nothing that my God is not able to do. And unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. Now that's a very familiar verse. Ephesians 3.20, many times people will quote that verse and they'll say, Oh, the Lord is able to do exceeding abundantly above all we ask and think. And they stop reading. They don't finish Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 20. That verse doesn't say that he's able to do Above all we could ask or think, that verse says he's able to do exceeding abundantly. Above all that we could ask or think, but watch what the rest of the verse says. According to the power that worketh in us. There is a power on the inside of every Christian. It's not preached about enough in the day that we live in. Therefore, churches are void of power. The preachers are void of power. And Christians are void the power of of the Holy Spirit. I'm preaching this morning on our great dependence upon the Holy Spirit and our Father. I thank you, Lord, for the great opportunity you've given us to be in your house this day. And God, you've given us an audience to speak to, and I pray that you'd open every ear and every heart, Father. God, Father, those that are listening uh, via the airways, God, I pray, Father, Lord, that you'd touch their heart, Father. And God, I pray, Father, that you'd anoint me with unction. Give me power, Father, and I pray, God, this morning, Father, Lord, that the Spirit of God would fall in this place, Lord. God, I believe I'd rather die than to stand in this pulpit this morning without the anointing power of the Holy Spirit. So, God, help me. Sanctify me. Make me a vessel of honor, sanctified meat for the Master's use. I claim the victory over the devil this morning and through the power of the Holy Spirit. And I pray that you deliver us. Help us to speak with power and authority, and we'll give you the praise. In Jesus' name I pray, amen and amen. In Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 14, 
The Apostle Paul tells the church at Ephesus that he bows his knees and he prays to God that that church at Ephesus would be strengthened by the Spirit of God. Look at your Bible in the inner man. I see in verse 16 that there is a strength and a might that is available and that strength and might is available through the power of the Holy Spirit. Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 17, I find that there is a way to be rooted and grounded in love. You might ask, what is wrong in America? One of the greatest problems there is in America is that folks and homes and men and women are not rooted in the Lord Jesus Christ. I can tell you that one of the greatest problems, if not the problem in America this morning, is not in the White House. It's not in the schoolhouse. It's behind closed doors at home, friend. And I'm telling you, as goes the home, so goes the church. And as goes the church, church, so goes the country. But I find in verse 17 that there is a way to be rooted and grounded in love. Verse 19, I find that there is a way to know the love of Christ. If you're lost this morning, you can know the love of Christ that passes all understanding. I find there's a way to know the love of Christ that passes knowledge that you might be filled with the fullness of God. Then in verse 20, I find that there is a God that is up in heaven that spoke everything we know into existence that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. That verse right there tells me that there is a power, Jack, on the inside of every Christian. May I submit to you this morning that there is a supernatural power available to every born-again child of God, and it is the power of the Holy Spirit. If you're taking notes and you're real interested, I'd like for you to write down Zechariah chapter chapter 4 and verse 6 and the Bible says then he answered and said unto me this is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel and he says this in Zechariah 4 and verse 6 watch this not by might not by power but by my spirit saith the Lord of hosts not by might not by power and not uh, Zechariah chapter 4 and verse 6 Not by might, not by power But by my spirit Saith the Lord of hosts John 6 and verse 63 The Bible says the flesh Profiteth nothing but it is the Spirit of God that quickens Us or makes us alive I hate dead dry worship I hate dead dry preaching I hate dead dry Altar calls I'm telling you there's A Spirit of God that lives on the Inside of every one of us and the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 6, the letter killeth. The law kills you, the Bible says. The letter killeth, but it is the Spirit that giveth life. And when you are alive in the Spirit, friend, there will be some evidence. I said when you're alive in the Spirit, there will be some evidence. As a matter of fact, you may laugh. You may, uh, you may laugh, you may smile, you may raise your hand, you may say hallelujah, you may shout to the top of your lungs. And by the way, it would be great for somebody to just rip loose shouting in this place this morning. It'd scare some of you absolutely to death. Somebody said, well, we don't do that here, do we? Yes. I do it every Sunday. Y'all seem to like it when I do it, but none of y'all do it. I'm not telling you to do it. I'm just saying that in the Bible, in Revelation chapter 5, when we see the throne of God, we see them shouting, Hallelujah! I don't believe shouting Anthony Pelham is like this. Well, Hallelujah. Well, I might raise my hand as long as nobody sees. Right? I'm telling you, the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 3 and verse 6, the letter killeth but the Spirit giveth life. And if you've got life in you, that will show up in your actions. It'll show up in the way you walk. It'll show up in the way you talk. And I'm telling you this morning, we need the power of the Holy Spirit. Charles Spurgeon said it this way, without the Spirit of God, we can do nothing. We are as ships without the wind, branches without sap, and like coals without fire. Watch this. Without the anointing power of God, we are useless. And I'm telling you that I am powerless without the Holy Spirit of God empowering me. Joe Arthur said it this way one time. He said, I can do more in five minutes under the anointing power of the Holy Spirit than I can do in five years in my own power. I'm telling you that education does not matter. I'm not against seminary. 
I'm not against education. Education's a good thing, not a bad thing. But when education tells you to go against the Word of God, education's wrong because the Bible's not wrong. And so education, it doesn't matter how much education you've got. It doesn't matter who your family is. It does not matter what side of the tracks you're from. The Bible says in the 127th Psalm in verse 1, he said, except the Lord build the house, they that labor that to build it, build it in vain. Unless the Lord keep the city, the watchman uh, labor in vain. Jesus said in John 3, the Bible said, a man can receive nothing lest it be given to him from above. I don't know about you, but I recognize just exactly what I am, and that's a big zero without the power and the anointing touch of the Holy Spirit. The Bible says in John 15, Jesus speaking, I'm the vine, you're the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. And without me, ye can do nothing. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, not that we are sufficient of ourselves. The Bible says not to think uh, anything of ourselves, but the sufficiency is of God. I'm telling you that the Lord Jesus Christ has given every believer the power of the Holy Spirit. Somebody said, when did I get it? It came into your heart at the very moment you believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says in Romans chapter 8 and verse 9, He that hath not the Spirit of God is none of his. You got baptized with the Holy Spirit and with fire when you were, I'm not a charismatic, I'm not a Pentecostal, I'm a Baptist preacher, but I'm telling you what's missing in both Baptist churches and that it is deader than 4 o'clock. Nobody ever preaches about the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit and then we come and we do the same dead dry thing time and time again we say why sit we here till we die I'm telling you something friend there is more than just dead dry worship there is power in the Holy Spirit of God the Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 7 for God has not given us the spirit of fear but of power that Greek word is dunamis power Dunamis. How many's ever heard that Greek word before? Raise your hand. Several of you. That Greek word is where we get our English word dynamite from. You know that you've got dynamite on the inside. Do you realize? I wonder what would happen, Shane, if I had a stick of dynamite like Bugs Bunny used to have. Everybody, everybody remember Bugs Bunny? They took him off because he warped children's minds. Better not preach there. I'll, I'll be here all day. They take a stick of dynamite. And, and I wonder if I had a big red stick of dynamite with a little fuse on the end. And I lit that thing and threw it out in the middle of the crowd. What you do with it? I'm convinced that some of you would sit there and hold it and go, what am I supposed to do with this? If you worship with the dynamite on the inside and you do the same thing with that as you do with a stick of dynamite, you'd sit there. Amen. I'm telling you that we ought to praise God for how good he's been. And the Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 7, God has not given us the spirit of fear. Watch this. Fear is not of God. Somebody said, where'd you get that? Come out of the Bible. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear. Watch. But of power. Dynamite. And of love. You want to know it's, whether it's of God or not? Do you love is there love in your heart? I know a lot of people that run around telling how saved they are and run around telling everybody else how good of a Christian they are and there's no love in their life. Hello. One of the fruits of the Spirit is love. And the Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 2, God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. The Bible says that, and if the Bible says it, friend, I believe it. But if we're not very careful as Christians and as workers in this church, we'll arrive at the place that we do not recognize nor do we feel our utter dependence upon the Holy Spirit. We get so busy. We get in such a hurry that we leave God out. And we run around thinking that we can make things work without God. But I'm submitting to you this morning that no church, no Christian worker, no mom, no dad, no employee can ever do the work of the Lord to its full potential without the anointing, without the help, and without the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, you can try. And there's a lot of preachers that do it. 
And there's a lot of teachers that do it. And trying to do the work of God without the power of the Holy Spirit will lead to physical, spiritual, and mental exhaustion. You do the work of God without the power of the Spirit of God, exhaustion will lead to discouragement. How many remember Elijah? You remember Will and Elijah in 1 Kings chapter 19 is sitting under the juniper tree asking God to kill him. Moses asked the Lord to take him out. They got discouraged. And I'm telling you, in a grace dispensation, without the power of the Holy Spirit, it will lead you to be exhausted mentally, spiritually, physically. Exhaustion will lead to discouragement. Discouragement will lead to lukewarmness. Lukewarmness will lead to God spewing you out of his mouth. And the last thing I want is for God to be dissatisfied with me. Listen to me carefully. One of the major reasons that there is no results in local churches or ministries is because the work is performed and the Spirit of God is absent. Woe unto Blessed Hope Baptist Church. Woe unto us when we take ease and think we can do it without God. Somebody say amen. Woe unto the Sunday school teacher or the preacher or the deacon or the trustee are the one that takes up the offering that thinks we can do anything in our own power. I'm telling you, if a church is ever to be great, if it's ever to be anointed, then the Holy Spirit must have absolute control of that church. He must have absolute control of that church through through its members. And I'm submitting to you this morning, we are foolish to think that we can go throughout our personal lives and our church lives, relying on our own strength and wisdom when we can tap into a supernatural power and turn the power on. I asked this question this morning. Is the power turned on in your life? I want to give you just a few things this morning. I'll be done. And I want you to listen carefully. If you're taking notes, number one, write down. We need the Holy Spirit's direction in preaching. We need the Holy Spirit's Direction in preaching. Can I say this, Anthony? There's too many dead sermons preached by too many dead preachers to too many dead congregations. The Bible says, Paul exhorts a young Timothy, and Shaney says it this way, preach the word. Guess what will happen? Things will start changing when the preacher preaches the word. I'm not here for a softball tournament. I'm not here for kids to play Nintendo. I'm not here to sit in a coffee bar. I'm here to preach. And if you want your kids to be a light in a dark world, they need preaching. Preach the word, be instant in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Now, some people don't like reproof, rebuke, and exhort, but Paul says that's what preaching is. I thank God that I had a preacher, an old time leather lung preacher, that preached the word of God and showed me where I was wrong. I'm telling you, we ought to stand on the word of God. Homosexuality is still a sin. I don't care what Holly Weird says about it. Amen. Homosexuality is wrong. Teach your kids that it's wrong. You don't pat that on the head. You tell them it's wrong. You tell them that it's an abomination unto God. Pride is still wrong. God hates it. A high look, Proverbs 6.16. God still hates abortion. He's still murder. Amen. How do I know all that? Well, I just didn't dream it up. Preach the word. Begins to end season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Somebody said, I can't believe where we're at in America. I can. For the time will come when they'll not endure sound doctrine. Can I say this? There's still some that will. You wouldn't be here this morning if you don't want to hear sound doctrine. I believe that all my heart. There's still a few places where sound doctrine is preached, taught, and accepted. Hallelujah. Amen. But the time will come, 1 Timothy chapter 4, 2 Timothy chapter 4, when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust they will heap to themselves teachers, heaven and ears, and turn many from the truth, and turn men unto fables. You know what happens in a lot of churches? The preacher gets up and he starts telling cute stories and starts telling fables, and nobody learns anything. Listen, if you don't learn the Word of God, you don't need this church. Hello? 
The Bible says in Amos chapter 8 and verse 11, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord God, that I will send famine in the land, not a famine of bread nor a thirst of water, but of hearing of the word of God. I'm telling you, there is coming a famine in the land, Amos said, and people are not going to hear anymore. I believe there's two reasons, Ethan, that people won't hear. The first reason is there's a lack of preaching. The second reason is when there is preaching, people stop their ears just like they did with Stephen. They didn't like his message, so they threw rocks at him. By the way, it's all right to throw rocks at the preacher because I'm telling you one thing that happened. They threw rocks at Stephen, and Jesus stood up in heaven and said, Come on in. Amen. (laughs) I'm telling you right now, we need the preaching of the Word of God. Powerless preaching is death unto death to a local church. Death unto death to a local church. Can I say this? There's a reason our services last longer here. Thank you. I said there's a reason our services last longer here. Most places when the clock strikes 12, the church gives up or dead. People's looking at the watch more than they're listening to the preaching. I'm telling you right now, you, uh, when, uh, when, uh, you'll be concerned about time if you're not concerned about the Holy Spirit showing up. But you can't be concerned about both. You're either concerned about time and getting out and not looking for the Spirit of God to show up, or you're worried about the Spirit of God and you can forget what, you can care less what the clock says. I'll tell you, there's been times where I preach till 12, 30, and 1 o'clock. Don't get scared. And I've said, is everybody all right? And I had dear ladies of this church that would say, go ahead, preacher. Wow, that that encourages me. That gets me excited. I want to be under the spout where the glory comes out. Amen. I want to be where God is. And I'm telling you right now, we need power in preaching. And we need the Spirit of God to show up. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, if you've got your Bible. If not, look on the screen. And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. Watch what Paul said. For I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and fear and in much trembling. Watch verse 4. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticement words of men's wisdom. Watch what he says. But in demonstration of spirit and dynamite and power that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men but in the dynamite of God. I believe sometimes if we're not careful we spend more time reading books about word power than we do praying. I believe some preachers give a lecture Instead of spirit-filled preaching, and that's the reason we have dead invitations, what happened to them? They sought after the wrong thing. They went after the wrong thing. Listen to me carefully. I can study. I can have my points outlined. I can speak with excellency of speech and perfect grammar. And if I don't have the anointing power of God show up in this pulpit, it won't amount to a hill of beans. God help us to do it. 1 Corinthians 1.17 For Christ sent me not to baptize but to preach the gospel not with wisdoms of words lest the cross of Christ be made of none effect. Anthony, I don't want to do anything to overshadow what God's done. I don't want to be cued up here in this pulpit. I want people to see Jesus. That's what I'm after. If there's anything I desire when people leave this church I want them to say God's in that. I want him to say, I felt the Spirit of God in that place today. I don't care one blessed thing about him saying Brian Simmons did that. I want him to say, God showed up and God got the glory, Jamie. That's what I want him to say when they leave here. And look at verse 5 of 1 Corinthians 2, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men. But in the power of God, 1 Thessalonians 1 and verse 5, our gospel came not to you in word only, but also in power. And in the Holy Ghost and in much assurance that you may know what manner of men that we were among you. When a preacher gets up in the pulpit, and I'll be honest with you, my desire in this pulpit is that if you are living a life that is not pleasing to Christ, my desire is that you are, if you are saved and that you are away from Christ, my desire, that it, my desire is that if you are not saved and you've never ever been born again, that my words cut like a hot knife through butter. And I can't do that by myself. 
the Spirit of God has got to come by and give an anointing. And the only way conviction comes, dear friend, is when the power of God's on the preaching. I've seen men stand and preach the Word of God. I've done it my own self. And I've watched men in the back row, in the middle row, and in the front aisle even hide from me like somehow it meant something what the preacher said or seen. It don't matter what the preacher says or sees. It matters what God sees. And God sees everything. I've seen man's hand, men's hands turn white where they grip a back of a pulpit and their fingers and their knuckles turn white where the power of God and the Spirit of God came into a service. Hosea chapter 4 and verse 6 says, My people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 38 says, If a man be ignorant, let him be ignorant. I'm submitting to you this morning that we need old time preaching. We need somebody to plow and shuck the corn. We need somebody to stand in the gap, hallelujah, and fill up the hedge. And we don't have to be ignorant. The Bible said... I would have you not to be ignorant. And the only way that we're going to get anything from God is if the Holy Spirit of God shows up and anoints the preaching. We need Holy Spirit direction in preaching. Number two, not only do we need Holy Spirit direction. I don't know about you, but I'm having a good time. Hallelujah. We need the Holy Spirit to direct us in our planning. Not only in our preaching, but we need the Holy Spirit to direct us in our planning. I'm telling you the problem in most churches is that they're void of the power of God. Now I've already told you this is not a social gathering. This is not a who's who. This is not a place. Look up here at me. It's not a place to make business contacts. This is the most powerful institution on the face of the earth. And it ought to be taken seriously. This is not a place to gossip. Leave your stinking gossip outside the doors. Hello! Gossip will tear a church up faster than anything in this world. You know the biggest problem people have? They got something to say about somebody and they won't say it to them. They say it about them. Matthew chapter 18, Jesus said, If you've got an ought against your brother, go to him. If it's a big enough problem, go to him. I'm telling you right now, we need the power of God in this church. It's the most powerful institution on the earth. And I'd rather die than be in a church without the power of God in it. I thank God we've got that. And I fear too many churches are coming and they've become a shrine to powerless preaching, a shrine to powerless fellowship, a shrine void of the power of God chain, and they've left Jesus outside the door. Just like Laodicea did. Remember that, Will? Behold, I stand at the door and knock. I've heard preachers use that for people's hearts, and I get that. But he was talking to Laodicea, and that wasn't a heart, that was a church. They were having church without God there. Jesus is knocking, saying, let me in. The last thing we ever need to do, Blessed Hope Baptist Church, is leave Jesus on the outside knocking. We need Jesus. and We need the Holy Spirit in our planning. Take down Acts chapter 20 and verse 28. Listen carefully. I'm going to slow down. I hope I got your attention. Acts 20 and verse 28. I say I'm going to slow down. Who knows if I will or not. Acts 20. In verse 28, take heed therefore unto yourselves. I've drove a UPS truck for 20-something years. And you know what I do when I see beware of dog? I beware. I take heed. I pull up to some houses sometimes, Ethan, you know what? And there's a beware dog sign and I look and I don't see the dog anywhere. And I say, where's the dog I'm supposed to beware of? They say, there's not one. It's just a bluff. I said, that's not funny. When you see beware, you ought to beware. When you say take heed, see take heed in the Bible, you better take heed. Acts 20 and verse 28, take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock, watch it, which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. I'm telling you that the Holy Spirit chose certain individuals to be overseers in the church. I said the Holy Ghost chose certain individuals to be overseers in the church. And I think it would do us all very, very well to let the Holy Spirit 
choose this church's officers. If the Bible says it, then we ought to make sure we do it. Amen? I'm telling you that we better be certain that we are praying about the matter of who the leadership in this church is and that it is inspired, watch this, by the Holy Spirit and not by politics. Y'all okay? I said it better be inspired by the Holy Spirit according to Acts 20 and verse 28. I'm telling you that God still calls men to preach the word. Somebody said, that's easy to accept, not in most places. I said, God still calls. Listen, I didn't wake up one day and said, I think that I'll be a preacher for my profession. I ran from being a preacher. But finally, I couldn't run no more. And the Holy Ghost said, you're going to preach. And I got tired of running. If you're led by the Spirit and you take an office in the church, I'm telling you that you'll have no problem being faithful to your office. Because if God's teaching you and telling you and inspiring you to take an office, if God says you're supposed to be a deacon, you'll have no trouble being faithful to this church. Boy, it's getting quiet in here. You know what that means? I mean to preach it more. Hey, listen. I want to say this. I believe with all my heart. I told Shane Davis the other night, we was in something over 600 churches in 11 years. And I've seen about everything you can think of. But just when I think I've seen it all, something else new comes up. And I've seen all different types of leadership structure and everything else. But I'm telling you, there's two ordained offices in the New Testament. Listen to me carefully. Bishop and deacon. And if God's called you to be a bishop or an overseer, you'll be faithful to the cause. If God's called you to be a deacon, you'll be faithful. And I believe with all my heart, we've got two of the best deacons in, a, in this world. Richard Underwood and Tony Maggart never, ever, ever miss church unless they're sick or on vacation. They are here, they are faithful, and they couldn't have performed the office of a deacon if they missed church because they wouldn't know what was going on. Amen? And I'm telling you, if God is calling you to perform an office, by the way, we're having a deacon and trustee election in May. You're going to hear a lot more about this. And there's been many a churches that's been busted into 10 billion pieces because men were unfaithful. And I'm telling you this morning that the Holy Ghost in Acts chapter 20 and verse 28 has made you overseers and the Holy Spirit of God chose the church officers. If you are a church member in this church and you want the Holy Spirit of God to be in control, you will vote for the man that demonstrates the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit in his life, that demonstrates the fruit of the Spirit in his life, not the guy's personality that you like the best. I wonder if I'm making contact or not. I said, you'll vote for the one who demonstrates the power of the Holy Spirit. You can't perform the office of a deacon, a trustee. Or you can't perform the office of a bishop if you are unfaithful to the house of God. We need the Holy Spirit to guide us and who the pastor ought to be. We need the Holy Spirit of God to guide us in who the deacons, the trustees, the teachers. Too many churches have died a slow death because somebody wanted to be a deacon, a trustee, a teacher, or a preacher for title instead of out of necessity. 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 16. Paul said, though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of for necessity is laid on me. Paul didn't do it for a title, Eddie. Paul did it because he had to. And I'm telling you that the Holy Spirit, and it would do this church and every other local church well. To understand that the Holy Spirit of God made them overseers in Acts chapter 20. We need to make dead sure that we get God's choice in the matter and not ours. Not only did he choose the officers, but he also directed where his servants were supposed to preach and teach. Do you know if a preacher is under the anointing and the power of the Holy Spirit and he's doing what he should be doing, that he'll have to go where the Holy Ghost says for him to go? I think we lose that sometimes. 
I think sometimes in our churches we get so comfortable and complacent with what we've got and we think, oh no, he can't go anywhere, he can't do anything, he's got to do this, he's got to do that. Last time I checked, the preacher reports to Jesus. Amen. The Bible says, don't get nervous. Acts 13 and verse 1. Now there were in the church that was in Antioch certain prophets and teachers. And as they ministered, if, you, if I've got your attention and you're paying attention to what the Bible says, say amen. amen. Now there were certain in the church that was in Antioch and certain prophets, verse 2. And as they ministered, Acts 13, 2, as they ministered and fasted, the Holy Ghost said. Remember, I'm preaching about our dependence on the Holy Spirit. The Holy Ghost said. The Holy Ghost said, separate me Barnabas and Saul. Separate me Barnabas and Saul. God didn't bring Barnabas and Saul together. He separated them. The Holy Ghost was in. Paul and Barnabas not coming together. Is anybody there? The Holy Ghost was in. Paul and Barnabas separating. And when they fasted and prayed, they laid their hands upon them and they sent him away. Do you realize that the Holy Spirit told his servants in the book of Acts in the early church where to preach? Acts chapter 8 verse 26, And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip and said, Arise. Here's Philip. He's a preaching deacon. And God speaks to him. And he tells him to arise, go toward the south into the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. And he arose and went. God spoke to him, told him where to go, and he got up and left. Look what the Bible says. He, and as he was returning, sitting in his chariot, he read Isaiah the prophet. He's talking about that man in verse 27 who was an Ethiopian eunuch. Then the Spirit said, verse 29. How many believe the Spirit can still speak? Sure did right here. Then the Spirit said unto Philip, Go near, join thyself unto the chariot. Philip wasn't going where he wanted to go. Philip went where God said go. Not only did he go where God said go, but the Bible says in verse 29, The Spirit said to Philip, Go near. And Philip ran. He got up. Left what he was doing because the Spirit said so and heard him read the prophet Isaiah. And he said, Understandest thou what thou readest? And he said, How can I except some man guide me? The Spirit of God told Philip what to do and where to go. And do you know that it is God that sends men in and God that brings men in and God that sends men away? I remember hearing Curtis Hudson tell about how he took Forest Hills Baptist Church in Decatur, Georgia. And Shane, he took that church with 12. And he took that church with 12. And in just a few short years, they went from 12 to 2,800 in Sunday school. It's incredible. To 2,800 in Sunday school. In 1980, he said, the Spirit of God began to start speaking to my heart. He was friends with Dr. John R. Rice, editor-in-chief of the Sword of the Lord. By the way, if I haven't talked about the Sword of the Lord enough, Sword of the Lord, it's out there on the back table. Get one. It'll help you. John R. Rice, editor-in-chief of the Sword of the Lord. John R. Rice is getting way up in years. One day, Curtis Hudson's secretary's telephone rings. She said, Dr. Hudson... Dr. Rice from Murfreesboro, Tennessee is on the phone. And he said, I got up out of my chair so fast, I hit both knees, hit my head and everything else. I almost killed myself trying to get to the phone. I couldn't believe Dr. Rice had called my secretary. He said he was my hero. And he said, I answered the phone. I said, Dr. Hudson speaking. He said, Dr. Hudson, this is Dr. John R. Rice. He said, I hear what you're doing down there in Decatur. I hear how God's touching. I hear how God's blessing. He said, we got a Sword of the Lord conference coming up in a few days. And he said, I wonder, could you come and speak to us at the Sword Conference? He said, can you hold please? He said, I put him on mute. He said, I thought to myself, I can't believe this is happening. 
He said, and then I thought to myself, no, I know. I, I can't believe it's happening. I prayed for this years ago. I knew God was going to use me like this. And he said, I went back on, come back on the phone. I said, Dr. Rice, I've checked my calendar both directions four years in advance and four years behind me. He said, I believe I'm open. And he said, I stood in front of thousands for the first time at a sort of Lord conference. And he said, I knew I was where God wanted me to be. He said, 1980, Dr. Rice called me and he said, Dr. Hudson, I'm getting too old, I'm sick. He said, the Holy Spirit has touched my heart. How do you feel about being editor of the Sword of the Lord? He said, Dr. Rice, I accept. He said, I went to my deacons. And I said, deacons? He said, I've got an offer from the Sword of the Lord. And I know that's where the Holy... He said, I didn't have to pray about it. God put it in my heart years ago. And God opened the door. And he said, deacons, I'm leaving. Dr. Rice is called and I'm supposed to be the editor of the Sword of the Lord. That's what God wants me. And they said, Dr. Rice, Dr. Hudson, you can't leave here. They said, Dr. Hudson, you are Forest Hills Baptist Church. He said, I got a different burden. He said, man, this is where I'm supposed to be. They said, Dr. Hudson, please, we'll double your salary. Dr. Hudson, please, you can't leave us. And Dr. Hudson said, I looked into the eyes of them men, and he said, if I please men, I cannot be the servant of God. Now, that's hard to understand. But thank God for men. Thank God for women. That when the Holy Ghost speaks, they will submit. Do you realize that the Holy Ghost of God should be in every bit of our planning? Every ounce of our planning. Sometimes the Holy Spirit directs in a way that people that are involved do not understand. Acts chapter 16 and verse 6 now, when, the, when they had gone through Ferga and through the region of Galatia, they were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach. Wait a minute. God called them to preach. Does everybody see that verse on the screen? Does that verse say that the Holy Ghost forbade them to preach? I'm telling you that we better have the Holy Spirit in every one of our plans. And the Bible says they were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach. There are times that God says, I want you to do that. Now, I've been preaching along the line of preachers, but let me say something. This is every Christian. There's times in your Christian life that the Holy Spirit says, you do this. There are times in your life that the Holy Spirit says, you do not do this. There's sometimes when there's multiple people involved that everybody does not understand. But I want you to get this, and I want you to get it clearly. People get themselves in absolute messes in their life by not getting the Holy Spirit of God involved in their plans. You better make dead sure if the Holy Spirit is telling you to take a job, you take it. And you better make dead sure that if he's telling you not to take one, you better not take it. Sometimes he speaks clearly, Tony. Sometimes it's just a still, small voice. Just a little knock. Hey, young people, look up here. You better make dead sure that when you get married, you're marrying the person the Holy Spirit tells you to marry. Not because she's a 10 out of 10. You better make sure, ma'am, before you get married that the Holy Spirit is telling, ma'am, sir, before you teach that class, you better make sure the Holy Spirit is telling you to teach that class before you buy that car. 
You know, a lot of people have bought things they can't afford with money they don't have to impress people they don't like. It's the truth. Hey, make sure the Holy Spirit tells you to do it. If the Holy Spirit tells you to drive a Ford Taurus from 1988, get in it with joy. Amen? Make sure the Holy Spirit tells you to buy that house. Make sure that, that the Holy Spirit is involved in your planning. And I'm telling you that God, the Holy Spirit, is able to give you direction for your future. Hey, make sure the Holy Spirit's telling you to attend this church. If He's not, don't come. If He is, you better stay. Amen? Make sure the Holy Spirit of God is involved in our transactions. Proverbs 3, verse 5, Trust the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not unto thy own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge Him. You know what He'll do, Paul? He will direct your paths. Carl, how does he direct our paths? By speaking to us by the power and the person of the Holy Spirit. If a good man's steps will are ordered by the Lord, how are they ordered? By the Holy Spirit of God speaking to us. When you marry, where you work, where you go to school, in everything you do, ask yourself the question, is the Holy Spirit laying this on my heart every time I book a preacher? At this church, every time I book a meeting, I don't do that haphazardly. I'm trying to pray and ask the Lord. Every time I book a singer, I'm asking the Lord, Lord, is this who you want to be here? Is this what you desire, Lord? Why do I do that? Because I want him involved in it. This is, I've said it very many times, this is not an entertainment venue. And too many churches have turned in to smoke and lights and entertainment. And they in turn have lost the power and the presence of God. If you make plans outside of the leading of the Holy Spirit, you are destined to fail in the buying and selling of church property. We better make sure the Holy Spirit's leading. In the children's church, we better make sure the Holy Spirit's leading. In the bus department. In the music department. We better make sure the Holy Spirit is leading our deacons and our trustees in preparation for Sunday school lessons. We need the leadership of the Holy Spirit in preparation of sermons and handling of tithe dollars. We better make sure the Holy Spirit... Somebody help me up here. We better make sure that the Holy Spirit is leading us. I think sometimes we... Start to plan, and we never pray. I think sometimes we start to plan, and we never pray, like somehow we know exactly what to do without asking God what He thinks about it. Like somehow we've got it all under control, and we can run it without God. By the way, if you want to run it without God, He'll let you. When you get up in the morning and you don't read your Bible and you don't pray, what you're saying by your practice is, I don't need God today. That's what you're saying by your practice. You're saying, Lord, I can run this day without you. Lord, I do not need you. And when you take that attitude, what you're really saying is, I can get along without God. And by the way, if you think you can, He'll let you. And you'll see just how powerful you are. But when you get up in the morning and you say, God, I don't want to make one single move unless you touch me, unless you anoint me, and you invite him in, guess what he'll do? He will show up. We need the Holy Spirit's direction in our preaching. We need the Holy Spirit's direction in our plan. Let me ask you something. What kind of plans have you made? How much have you consulted the Lord about it? And how much have you listened to the Holy Spirit about it? Number three, and I'm done. Lastly, we need the Holy Spirit's direction in prayer. The Holy Spirit's direction in prayer. Can I say this? You're not going to get very far without prayer. 
A.J. Gordon said, there's more you can do after you pray, but there's nothing you can do until you pray. Ian Bounds said, what the church needs today is not more machinery or better machinery, not new organizations or novel methods, but men whom the Holy Ghost can use. Men who are mighty in prayer. Let me ask you something. Has there ever been a time in your life when you woke up and you was excited to pray? And you thought, I get to pray today. I'm so thankful that I can reach the throne of God. That I can call out to God who spoke everything we have into existence. And I'm so excited that I can pray. Has there ever been a time where you felt like you needed to pray? And you were so thankful that you had the ability to pray. And you got down on your hands and knees or you were somewhere where you couldn't do that and you just began to call out and cry out to God. But you know what I found out? And I want to be honest. There's been a lot of times, Chad. I'm just being honest. I didn't want to pray. I remember about 15 years ago when the Lord called me to preach, I was so on fire for God. God took about five years, Dad. And for about five years, every morning when I woke up for two to three hours, that's all I did. Seven days a week. Seven days a week. For five years, Shane. God burned me up. And I remember a preacher told me during that time, an older preacher, he said, there'll come a time in your ministry and a time in your Christian life, there'll be times when you don't want to pray. And I thought to myself, that guy has to be the most unspiritual man I've ever met. I thought to myself, and he's a preacher. I don't want to be like him. And there come a day when his words came back to my mind. Anthony, when I got up and the world around me was upside down, and I said, God, where are you? God, if this is the way it's going to be. God, if this is really what you want, I must be out of your will. And I did not want to pray. But you know what I did? I did it anyway. And I'm telling you right now, maybe you've not arrived there. Maybe you never arrived there. But I'm telling you this morning that there will be times that you don't want to pray. There will be times that you are not inspired to pray. There will be times when your flesh gets in the way. But I'm telling you the Lord will come by if you'll just keep doing what I'm telling you from experience. If you'll keep doing what you know is right. If you'll pray when you don't feel like praying. One day after a while, the Holy Ghost will go. And you'll be down on your knees saying, God, where are you? It might be a week. It might be a month. It might be six months. Praying, God, where are you? God, come by. And nothing. But you keep on doing what you're supposed to do. I've been in my prayer closet before. Doing what I was supposed to do, whether it felt good or not. And the Holy Spirit go by and say, And it was right then that I knew God was trying to teach me something. God was trying to look up here at me. I've never learned anything when it was all smooth. I've never learned a thing when everything was going my way. 
I did all my learning when it was hard. I did all my learning when God seemingly was nowhere around. Job 23 and verse 8, I go to the left and he is not there. And to the right he is not there. And I back up and he is not there. And forward and he is not there. But he knoweth the way that I take. And when I am tried, I will come forth like gold. If you don't feel like praying, keep praying. Romans chapter 8 and verse 26. Likewise, the Spirit helpeth our infirmities. Watch this. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit maketh intercession for us with groanings that cannot be uttered. Many times in prayer, we don't know what we should pray for. We may be asking God for something we don't need. Have you ever prayed for something and you wanted it so badly and it never happened? And you said, maybe it's unanswered prayer. Look up here. It wasn't unanswered prayer. God answered it. The answer was no. The answer was was no, and sometimes we don't know how to pray. And Romans 8, 27 says, And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. I want you to put down 1 John 5, 14 in your notes. 1 John 5, 14. And this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will... When you're praying, do you say, God, I want to be in your will. God, I'm asking for this. But God, I'm asking according to your will. Watch this. If I got your attention, if, you, if, if you're here, say amen. God, I'm asking according to your will. And God, if this is not your will, change my heart. If this is not what you want, change my praying. The only way that you can be absolutely sure that you are asking according to the will of God is, number one, he's already told you what his will is in the Bible. I don't have to ask God, Tony, if it's the will of God for people to be saved. 2 Peter 3, 9, For God is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish. It's God's will that everybody be saved. Regardless of what the Calvinists say. Amen. Either God spells his will out in his word, or God comes by by the person of the Holy Spirit. Let me ask you something, and I'm closing. Have you ever been in a point, in a place, in a position to where you were so burdened, hurt so bad, that you didn't even know what to say when you prayed? You know, Hannah prayed, and Jamie, her lips moved, but no sound came out of her mouth. And Bruce, I believe that she prayed in the Spirit. And Ephesians 6, 18 says, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. Have you ever been so burdened that all you could say, you didn't have perfect grammar to say it? You didn't even know what to say. All you could say was, God help me. God help me. God, you know what? He hears that prayer. I'm telling you that we need the Holy Spirit in our praying. When the Holy Spirit is at work in a church, when the Holy Spirit is work in somebody's, at work in somebody's life, when the Holy Spirit is working in your prayer life, when He's at work in preaching, when He is at work in your planning, you will know. The evidence of the Holy Spirit is not speaking in tongues. The charismatic movement says, oh, you've got the Spirit because you spoke in tongues. The evidence of, speaking in of the Holy Spirit is not speaking in tongues. The evidence of the Holy Spirit is this, Ephesians 5, 18. Be not drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. Watch, here's the evidence. Speaking to yourselves in Psalms. When you go out through your day, do you ever do something like this? What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. 
what can make me whole again? And the Spirit of God just comes by. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Making melody in your heart unto the Lord. Are you filled with the Holy Spirit? Have you got the Holy Spirit involved in what you're doing? Have you prayed for your preacher? God anoint him. We need the Holy Spirit of God in the preaching. Have you prayed for your planning? God, I don't want to do anything without you. How about in your prayer? Do you recognize? I'm asking this and we're having an invitation. Every one of you, I want, to, I want you to answer this in your heart and mind. Look up here at me. Do you recognize the need for the Holy Spirit in your life? Do you recognize the need for his direction? Stand to your feet, every head bowed and every eye closed in this place.